Down, uh, some of us down here at the Capitol. Thank you. I believe I heard there's nine joining us via Zoom. <laughs> and, uh, we're still at, and we're still adding. So I also anticipate there'll be a few more that are going to trickle in uh, down here in the, in the house building. Uh, we have two, four, six, about nine of us in here right now. Um, so thank you very much for joining us this morning, and we're going to get going here. Um, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth Wafel, who is our lobbyist, and she's going to start us off uh, with discussing discussing our legislative agenda. Yes, hi there. Okay, so where am I looking? <laughs> For those of you who are online, we've got this really nifty device that literally looks like an owl. You may all be familiar with this best. technology. I am not. Um, I, I had printed off my sort of outline and I think I left it at my office. So I'm just trying to pull it up. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of what I wanted to talk about, so, um, uh, so again, I'm Elizabeth Wafel. I'm a lobbyist with Blair Minnehood. I think I know many of you. I've worked with some of you on other parks and trails projects. I've been working with the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails Organization for almost a decade. Um, and sort of my role here is to try and help shepherd sort of our legislation and our goals through um, the various committees and bodies. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, we're in a different place this year. You know, this um, is the first time in, you know, in six, eight years where we've had, you know, what they call a trifecta. Um, and that's, uh, you know, all Democrats in the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. And it does have an impact on sort of our agenda and what we can we can push through. Um, I, I always tell folks that um, you know it, both parties are good and bad for um, for your interests. And sort of from a Parson Press standpoint, um, you know I would say that in general the Democrats tend to like putting money into Parson Trails more, but. Um, the Republicans tend to be more supportive of Greater Minnesota. So it's been a very tricky sort of. Um, needle for us to thread over the last year, couple of years, um, you know, because we've had support for us in general, like, for example, some of the, you know, some of the Senate Republicans, but what we ran into was that um, they just didn't like to spend money, and where the Democrats like to spend money, and they didn't want to necessarily put your parts for Minnesota, but what we're hoping is, is that, you know, Democrats couldn't have that majority without greater Minnesota. We still, not as many, but we have Democrat legislators out there. We also have, again, still, you know, support from Republicans is that we can use this change in circumstance to our advantage. And so um, what I'd like to do now is just kind of talk first sort of what is our, what are our goals and what are we trying to accomplish this legislative session? And, um, you know, we adopted this fall our uh, our legislative, and I think I have a copy of it, but our legislative policies. And um, we adopted legislative policies and an agenda. Our policies pretty much say that, and I, sorry, if you don't have it online, we'll make sure you get a copy sent out to you. Um, and it may also be on our website. Um, but our policies sort of state what we believe in year after year. And those are the important things that, uh, you know, this is the principles we stand for. This is what, you know, if things pop up in the legislature, what we're going to sort of focus on. The other side is our legislative agenda. And those are the things that we're affirmatively going after. And I'm going to kind of walk through what we're doing on those. So our number one priority for the even years, um, the legislative biennium is basically sort of split into what they call budget and non-budget years. This is a budget year. They have to do the entire state budget by the end of June. If you what? Okay, thank you. If you have not, you know, been paying attention over the last couple of years, they've had problems getting that done by the end of June. We're hoping since they're all the same party, they won't need to go in a special session, but I'll be honest, nothing surprises me anymore. Um, but they have to get the budget done, and they typically will get the legacy funding done this same year as well. The one thing I always point out to people is that legacy is not a must, you know, they try to have try to pass, but they don't have to pass um, a legacy bill. Um, they don't have to pass a tax bill. They usually do during this year, and we will push them hard. They have not failed to do that 
in conjunction with other budget bills since there's been a legacy bill, but they would we'll try to get it done. So our first goal, as you can see that, is that we want to make sure Greater Minnesota uh, receives, you know, at least its 20% share of legacy. So I'll be honest, I always say at least because we will always take more. Um, we have sort of, you know, over the last couple legislative biennium sort of gelled into a situation where Metropolitan Parks gets 40%, DNR parks get 40% and we get 20% of that. Is that ideal? Maybe, maybe not. I always think we should get more, but there are some political battles that you have to like count the votes and see what you're gonna win. And right now we don't have votes to, win to disrupt that formula. So we'll be talking later about other ways that we are trying to get more money put into greater Minnesota. So, we are hoping, you know, we've got um, an experienced chair in the house, Leon Lilly, who's from North St. Paul. You know, we have a great relationship with him. Renee has a great relationship with him. Renee Matson is the uh, executive director of the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks Transmission is sitting next to me. I don't know if you can see that online. I don't understand how this all works. <laughs> Renee says, says something else. Yes, yeah, so he comes so towards on. me and when you turn it on, it goes, whoo, whoo. Oh my gosh, technology, I tell you, I'm getting old. Uh, but anyways, it, you know, we've got good relationships with, you know, Representative Lee, at least as far as we can tell, he has no intention to try and disrupt that formula. But sometimes people in his caucus may try to do otherwise. Um, we have seen situations in the past where folks, particularly from, I won't say which cities in the metro area, but they start with an M and N with an S, um, will try and disrupt that. We're hoping they don't, but we will be, again, very focused on making sure that happens. In the House, the legacy chair is new. It's um, Senator Fuang Her from St. Paul. Um, I've had a good relationship with him for years. He, this is his first time chairing legacy, but you know, he's a big supporter of the outdoors. He loves to bike. He loves, he likes Greater Minnesota. Um, he's given no indication that he's going to disrupt that formula. The vice chair of that committee is Senator Jen McEwen, who is from Duluth. Um, and Duluth has been a you know, strong recipient of legacy funds, so she has a strong interest in also preserving the formula. So again, our number one priority, we're hoping it's not a fight, but it is always there, and that's one of the reasons we exist. Um, as far as legislation go, though, and this is the kind of thing I really wanted to hit on, we have introduced some legislation that we are really going to be pushing hard on trying to fund. Um, as I mentioned, we only get 20% of the legacy. Right now, there could be some changes, a little preview on what's going to talk about next, but that's really been our only funding source. And I think the frustration for a lot of us is, is we absolutely value, value the commission. The work that Renee and Joe does is invaluable. It needs to happen. But the funding for them comes out of our 20% legacy share. And the DNR and the Metropolitan Parks don't need to be spending sort of their 40% on how they you know, evaluate and do all of this stuff and the work that they put together on their system. So we think it's only fair, particularly given the extensive general fund support that those two entities receive from the legislature that we get some general fund money to pay for the operations of the um, of the commission. And so we've introduced a bill. It is um, SF 527, and we'll be posting this stuff on our website afterwards. It's been a very crazy session, so trying to keep up with everything that's been happening. It's SF 527, which is authored by Senator Grant Housechild in the Senate, and then House File 873 um, in the House. And um, that's authored by Representative David Lislagar. He's from the Iron Rage, um, as is Grant Housechild. Um, he's from in town, but also covers the entire range, the former town box seat. And the bill is very simple. It literally, I can even show it to you, sort of um, pull it out of my purse. It literally is like four lines. It just says $500,000. Hi there. Hi there. Um, Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails? Yep. Come on in. Um, no worries. Um, $500,000 um, per year, so $1 million per biennium. Um, towards uh, the commission from the general fund. And the reason we want that is that if we can pay for the commission's work out of legacy funding, for those in the room, we actually have a handout about it. We're going to have you take as you go meet with legislators. And we'll make sure that, again, that you all who are online have it for later. But think about it. If we are able to pay for the commission's um, work out of the legacy funds, that frees up an additional million dollars per biennium to pay for grants. Think about what you guys could do in your own parks and trails with half a million dollars. 
or $250,000 or whatever. Putting more money into that legacy funds is good for all of us. Um, so that's really why it's become a, a top goal. Um, I'm hoping we get more traction on it this year. We are, um, you know, one of the things I've been doing, I actually just got back Renee and um, Jessica from Duluth. The three of us were meeting with a legislator from Duluth who, um, is not on the list legacy committee, but we are trying to reach out to all greater Minnesota legislators, particularly right now, again, the Democrats, because they're in control, to make sure they understand our goals and are helpful within their caucus. So big goal, really going to make a push to make this happen. So that's top goal um, in terms of like active legislation. The next thing we are um, going to be doing is, you know, one of our top priorities, if you were to look at our sort of ongoing legacy policies, um, is trying to make sure that there's also support for local parks and trails grants. For those of you who have been very long time members, you may remember when this organization started, it was actually called Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails. Coalition. The word coalition, right. And so there were regionalists in there. And that when I became lobbyist, one of the first suggestions I made was like, we should remove the word regional because at the end of the day, we know not all of you can qualify for legacy designation. And we also know that not all parks and trails, even when you can qualify, I mean, there's probably Duluth and Sherburn County and Stearns County parks that um, are, you know, they're great parks, but they don't qualify that as a level of, of legacy. So it's really important to us to make sure that money is going into those DNR programs. And I, to be honest, this is why I always call it our, our catch is catch can policy goals, where we are always pushing on legislators and other entities to put more money into it. Um, the LCCMR, which is the Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources, has been sort of over the last number of years, we've worked with the DNR to make sure that they're including it as an ask. And that the LCCMR is approving it is we put grant we put um, uh, grant money into um, those money, those uh, programs from the LCCMR. And so um, the LCCMR, if you've ever done a grant through the LCCMR, you'll know that it's kind of an extended process. It starts like right now. You get your application in, you get chosen to be, you know, present, and then they make their recommendation that just takes forever, and then it has to go back to the legislature. So it's a lengthy process, but right sometimes they don't approve it. Which sometimes they don't approve it. As Renee pointed out, one of the reasons we've been focused on making sure they pass the bill is the last couple of years, it took them a couple of years to get the recommendations passed. But we've had both, many of our members have gotten grants there, but they've also been funding the DNR programs, and there's over $3 million for those local programs. So it's really important um, Right now, I think that they're going to pass it, but I'm going to talk about one of the concerns we have with some language changes. Um, but we really want them to, you know, pass an LCCMR bill that includes that money. We are also um, there are some other pockets. Um, you all may remember Senator Kerry Rood, who was one of our biggest champions over the last decade. Um, uh, for Parks and Trails, unfortunately, she lost her seat kind of in a redistricting fight. We're hoping she might end up being active and related organizations again, but um, she she helped us, I don't want to say sneak, because it really was a sneak. We sneaked $500,000 per year for those parks and trails into the ongoing state budget. We don't talk about it a lot, but I don't want anybody to take it out. In fact, we've had to remind the Republicans that, no, that you put that in there. Don't, they tried to take it out last year. It's like, guys, don't do that. Um, so there's different paths that we have in there. So it's really important for that. And again, all of you, you know, even if you have um, a legacy for your other parts and trails in your, you know, your city or county, great place to go for funds. Um, the thing I do want to say about the LCCMR is, well, in general, this legislative session is, has been crazy, absolutely crazy, fast and furious. So keeping track of things is a really, you know, it's been, it's been challenging, but also they're just moving stuff fast. The chair of the house, I want to be honest, I think he likes the outdoors. In fact, I know he likes the outdoors, but I'm not a huge fan necessarily always of Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails or Parks and Trails in general using money from the LCCMR. So he put some language into this year's LCCMR bill that would say, if you were getting a grant from there, you have to have a 50% match. And his theory is, well, this acts like bonding. So of course you should have to have a 50% match. Well, here's a couple differences. With bonding, you can, as, as we know, um, you can actually ask the legislature to waive the 50% match or have something else act as a match. This one should allow that because the LCCMR can't waive the requirements of the legislature. So putting it in statute is a problem. 
The other problem is, is that, you know, especially for smaller communities, you know, there's not, as I mentioned, not a lot of resources for parks and trails. This is one of the few ways that we can actually try to get, you know, funding for those individual projects. So it's really important to us. So we are going to be, again, trying to push on legislators to um, not include that restriction in the LCCMR. It's going to be challenging. Yeah, there's, other people, I'm interested. Yeah, there's, there's other people that are working on it. It's going to be challenging, but it's something that we need to be talking to folks about. And so, which, could you repeat the chair's name, the one that you mentioned? Is that okay? It's, it's Chair Kurt Hansen in the House. He, okay. um, you know, he, I think, likes the outdoors, but I, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a metro person. It's a metro person, and you know, legislators fight for their region. So there you have it. <laughs> He's office number four oh seven. We uh, we will we will, yeah we will respectfully ask that he uh, support our funding requests. Um, you know, it is one of the things that it is frustrating to me that um, you know, so one of the goals I actually want to point out is that we um, you know. We push back on bad legislation. And so that is one of those pieces that I think is not great. It was not on our legislative agenda to even be talking about that, but it popped up. It was flagged to us last week. And so now we are trying to get the message out that out about that as well. Um, I do want to mention something else that was not in our um, policy proposals or policy goals. In fact, I'm going to be highlighting this in our newsletter that's going to be going out later this week, but some of you may be familiar with the concept of lottery in lieu. Um, basically, what the lottery in lieu is, when the lottery tickets are sold, there's no sales tax. So the lottery has to basically send money to the state to make up for that loss of sales tax. And that money is dedicated to a number of different outdoor um, recipients. Um, those outdoor recipients include 22% of that goes to DNR, 22% of that goes to Metro Parks. How much do you want to guess goes to Gary, Minnesota? How much, Sarah? Oh, I sixty percent. Sorry, I'm sorry. I yeah, no, no, no. numbers. Zero. <laughs> sorry. Zero. Numbers. Sarah. No, I don't like doing math in public. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry. Not, I'm not sixty. I sixty percent would be great. Unfortunately, currently there is zero, and so again, when I talk about the things being fast and furious, we found out on I believe it was now it's been two weeks. Now it was on a Friday. You know, I'm sitting in my office looking through bill intros and committees that are up next week, and all of a sudden we discovered they introduced and scheduled for hearing a bill like that that would have that was about the lottery and loot, but what it was doing was expanding the total pie going into the lottery and loot because before 74% of the lottery proceeds that they had to make went to this list of organizations. They were changing it so 99% went. And I'm just like, hey, wait a minute. Maybe some of that should go to Greater Minnesota. We've raised that issue before. And so I got a hold of Ben and Gina and Renee and a couple others. And we got a hold of the Senate author and said, wait a minute. You need to put some of that towards Greater Minnesota. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind and a lot of work over the last week and a half. But working with Grant Housechild, who's authoring our, um, our other bill, he was the author of Lottery and Lou. He was able to negotiate a deal where we're now getting um, 2% um, of the lottery and new funds, where we got 0% before, um, you know, for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. So that is an extra million going to the commission to be granted out each year. So again, we'll see what we can do. You got to get, a, you know, your foot in the door, you know, nose under the camel's tent, and that's our nose under the camel's tent um, of getting there. But we have never had that before. And a big thank you to everybody who was involved. Renee testified one day, as did Sarah from our board. She's on the, um, with the, the St. Louis County Railroad. Um, Gina came down yesterday. I got to watch her uh, on video. Um, you did a great job. She came down and talked about some of the important work that the commission does. And so it's been really, really good how that happened and how it came together. And um, really super excited about that funding. Um, and we are going to continue to be looking for opportunities to expand the pie for Greater Minnesota. Um, I was just talking with Jessica and Renee about this, but I think you know, sort of one of sort of my vision that I would like to see us doing over the next couple of years is taking advantage of how sort of things have changed in the legislature and really trying to be stronger about Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails as a you know 
a brand for lack of a better word. You know, we've got folks who are willing to spend money on parks and trails. We just need to make sure that they're willing to spend money on farm parks and trails. And I do know, particularly in the Senate, but in the House, we've got some helpful legislators. We just had a great meeting with Rob Kozlowski. We're going to be meeting with other legislators throughout this session you know, who understand the importance of this money to greater Minnesota. And again, I want to reassure you, we will be working with both parties but right now, you know, you start with who's in charge and then you move out. Um, so we're working, we're meeting with everybody. Renee and I have been meeting with both people from both parties and that's been really essential. But, you know, really trying to focus people on, you know, what greater Minnesota, you know, the, parks, the regional parks and trails system has been around since, what did we, you know, about a decade. And I think the commission was founded in 2013. Since then, 74 parks, trails, special features have been designated and made tremendous progress without a lot of money. Think of how much more we can do. Um, I know that uh, Duluth and uh, Wright County and Lyon County, for example, just got grants to do track chairs. So there's a lot of exciting stories that we can talk about. We need legislators to understand what we're doing and why it is so important and really sort of driving home. You know, the message, again, so we have Renee come and testify to Johnny on the spot, had him come down last week on Tuesday to talk about this lottery and Lou issue. And the house church response was, well, you know, greater Minnesota gets other money. You know, the DNR and the state parks are located in greater Minnesota. And, uh, well, you know, hunting and fishing happens well, in greater Minnesota. Minnesota. Actually, you get 60% of the outdoor fund. Right. It all goes to greater Minnesota. But it doesn't go to greater Minnesota parks and trails. And sort of supporting, you know, sort of preservation of fishing land or hunting land, not going to denigrate that in the least. Um, you know, but it isn't developing those natural resources so the citizens of Fraley, the citizens of Duluth and St. Cloud and all your you know, cities can go out and use their resources. So we are really trying to emphasize what a regional park is and why, again, we deserve to be in sort of parity and equal funding with um, mm -hmm. metro parks. So that's kind of our sort of vision. And then I, I'm going to start getting into, just from a timing standpoint, especially for those of you who are online, it's 1025. I'm very excited. I am, I got a twofer when I did my invite to the DNR. I invited Shannon Lassauer and she said, I'm going to come, but I'm also going to bring Commissioner Stroman. So wasn't <laughs> expecting that. So they're going to be coming in, but they're going to be, as we say it, you know, at the legislature, they're going to be coming in hot right at um, 1030 because they have an appointment in the Senate. So they're going to be sort of running a little bit, you know, as they can. Um, we're going to have both of them talk on but I have another piece that I want to talk about for messaging from the legislators. But when they arrive, we're going to step back and then I'm going to sort of finish up with what I'm talking to you about. And I'm going to be giving lobbying tips for both in person and online. Um, and then when they come, I thought, you know, that might also be, again, because we're not a huge group, but time to do a very quick round of introductions so the commissioner and Senate, you know, Shannon know who they're talking to. So um, we'll do it very, very, very quickly. Are they out there? Okay, she's going to go check. Meanwhile, I'm going to continue talking. Um, is there, by the way, if there's any questions online, put them in the chat. Brad is sitting right in the cross uh, I have a question. Okay. Okay. Earlier term, we use chat shares. Chat shares. And can you just talk a little bit about that? Is what that is and how you use it? What well, you two can answer this question. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm just Peterson from Duluth. Uh, I can tell you how we envision using it when it is on my Duluth. Um, so we, uh, the Parks and Rec Department, partnered with one of our regional parks, Hartley Park and Nature Center, who has a building where we rent some like, equipment and gear to the general public with operating hours, et cetera. Um, so they agreed to house our track here in the Nature Center and check it out to the public as they do other pieces of equipment during their. So it's one of their charitable tracks. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and it has a trail network um, of trails that are of the right topography, grade, et cetera, for a meaningful experience in the park. Okay. Um, so you can really immerse yourself in the park um, with this device. Okay. 
No, we're very excited about that. Hopefully, again, I don't know how this all works. All of you heard what was said about the structures, but they, you know, Renee um, and the commission just granted to Wright, um, to, to Duluth and then Lyon County, um, the funds to do a track share. And what I understand for Renee, and she'll talk more about it, they're going to be doing that more. But that kind of thing, one of the things, um, and we're going to start talking about messaging, one of the things that's important to a lot of folks right now in talking about funding is talking about accessibility. And so those legacy funds are allowing folks like Duluth, Wright County, Lyon County, and hopefully more of you going forward to access those, those chairs. And sort of talking about that, I think sort of really, you know, it's a real goal of the current majority, you know, in both the House and the Senate to make things more accessible. And if we're going to make things more accessible, we're doing that not just in Greater Minnesota, but in, um, you know, excuse me, not just in the Metro, but in Greater Minnesota. And um, well, I just have not been sitting long enough to meet Sarah. Thank you. I yeah, we almost, we'd almost before the uh, and um, yeah, so I guess I don't know if they have had a chance. Have you have you actually seen all before? This is so cool. I used one. <laughs> Sorry. So we don't use them at DNR, but I just used one at Department of Revenue last week for the mm -hmm. first time. Great. Well, I took a picture of it because it was it's very <laughs> cool. Oh, I was told our IT does not like oh really money must stuff that in under the way. It's stuck it in somehow. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I was uh I was a little not sure about the other. Oh wow. Okay. Oh, thank you everybody. Like that coming in. Yeah, just yeah. 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 so yeah. if we can settle it yeah. here we have uh commissioner uh yeah. 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 off the entrance, then Cool. Yeah, I don't remember your name. Andrews. Andrews. Yeah. You were with us uh, for earlier. Uh, yes. Anne is our director for right. the Division of Mercy Chess. Perfect. So I think we're going to go around and do a quick introduction just so you know who's all with us. We have uh, nine of us here in the room, but we also have a few online. So I'm Ben Anderson, and I'm the Strength County Parks Director and also the Chair of the Greater Minnesota Park. Trail organization. And I'm Sarah Weed. I am also a county with the Renee Matson, Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. Elizabeth Wavell, um, Clarity and Hood, August for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. And I am Renee Gina Hugo, Parks Coordinator for the River. Thanks, Regina. Good morning, Justin Peterson, City of Dual Parks and Recreation Manager. Ben Holy, Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. And what we uh Rector County and Praise the EDA and uh part on the North Country Trail and the Hottertail River Trail. I remember you had that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Harrington, Brad County Parks and Rec, as well as Great Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And We've got some online. online too. Yeah. yeah. So, do we want to go through all the online? Why don't you just read the names? Because it's going to be hard to. We should have. If we had a screen, it would be easier. But why yeah. don't you? Look. So online, we have Mike Bigger with Rochester Parks and Rec. Yeah. We have Carlin Ziegler with Olmstead. They're both on the board. So Joseph Tart as well is on the board with us, um, and he is Chicago. Brad Baum with Douglas County is on with us, and he is also one of the commissioners. Uh, Shannon Mortensen with City of Warren, who is on Greater Minnesota board with us. Ross Demand with Wright County Parks and Rec. Now, if I don't know what organization from here, please forgive me. Uh, well, Jenna Tuma is with us. Uh, we also have Tyler Luthier, who's Tyler is with Sword. the Seward. Phil Walkholtz. Don't know who Phil's with. Um, MJ Knudsen with Oatana, Patrick Hollister, and I don't know who Glenda is because I don't see a last name on Glenda. So. All right. Well, thank you, Brad and Last, and welcome. Thank you for thank taking you. the time today to join us. And uh, they're going to give us a little bit of an update on the DNR's legislative activities and their budget with respect to the parks and trails. I did miss Jesse from Rinville as well. Well, I apologize. Excellent. Did you want to release that? Well, thank you so much, everyone, for having us. Um, again, I'm Sarah Stroman, a commissioner of Minnesota DNR, and um, all we have um, Shannon Lothammer and Ann Pierce, and Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer is somewhere in the hallway. Um, 
Bob is in charge of our uh, government relations work and also uh, works with our divisions of fish and wildlife and enforcement. So um, I thought given that this was a legislative discussion and he and I are uh, tied together today in our morning of the Capitol, uh, that it would be good to have him here. So we'll, I don't know where he went, but. Um, <laughs> Okay, that's that's typical. Um, I had to laugh that I was the first one to get to the Senate building this morning, and as I was waiting for Bob to get in and get off the elevator, I ran into several people who said, "Hi, Commissioner, where's Bob?" <laughs> I was like, "I don't know," and I hope he comes because. So um, I think Shannon and Ann and I are really excited to have some conversation with you all about the governor's budget. Um, for the next biennium and what we really feel is an incredible opportunity for parks and trails and outdoor recreation and natural resources more, more broadly. Um, with a, and, and I wanna just emphasize as we approach this budget exercise um, and what we put forward in recommendation to the governor, I think very much in line with what you've heard from us before, one, with, with an eye to the future. We don't wanna to continue to have conversations just about plugging holes or um, getting us back to where we were some number of years ago. We um, really want this to be forward looking about how Minnesotans are using those spaces today, how they're gonna be using them in the future and how we meet those needs going forward. And so just as context, I think some of you are familiar with our For the Outdoors initiative. This is really about um, how we get to sustainable funding really through a DNR lens, but Renee, you and um, our Metro Park folks know this is not to leave any of us behind, um, but really thinking about some specific steps we can take in the next four years to get us on a more sustainable footing. So this is kind of the long-term context in which we looked at our budget. And then what we did was look at the opportunity of having a state surplus that is, you know, largely a one-time opportunity, um, but also understanding we have some ongoing needs. And so what we tried to do was say, okay, we're in this moment, there's some one-time opportunities. This is our long-term vision. We know we need to bridge from one to the other two. And so this budget we put forward really is about the, the now and the bridge, and then this will um, pick us up going forward. And um, so what you'll see here is a pretty um, heavy emphasis on what I, I'll call our flagship budget initiative, Get Out More, Modernizing Outdoor Recreation Experiences. And I want to be clear, this is not just about fixing what's broken or again, plugging holes of a system that was built a generation ago. It's really about forging the next um, set of experiences for the future. And, and we chose that word experiences um, really deliberately because it's not just about the built infrastructure, but it really is about what people experience at those at those places. And so you'll see some of it is about infrastructure, whether it's a, a building or a trail or a boat ramp. Some of it is about the programming that we do in those spaces. Um, and so um, the governor put forward a recommendation of $118 million for Get Out More, and that's for enhancing access and welcoming new users to public lands. Um, revitalizing camping and related infrastructure, modernizing boating access, and then enhancing fisheries and fishing infrastructure by um, modernizing hatcheries and then also focusing on shore fishing and pure fishing opportunities. So that um, again is is kind of our flagship. Um, we can we can talk more about that. The other thing you'll see for state parks and trails, and I'll let Ann talk more about this, is then really focused on those operations of. Um, trails, maintenance, funding, and visitor services in that ongoing way. And so again, just representative of, we wanted to focus on um, the places that people <laughs> go, the experience they have while they're there, and um, you know, all of those aspects, not just one. We don't want to choose between, well, we'll provide the trail, but we won't maintain the trail, right? We don't want to choose between, we'll provide the park space, but the camping experience may not be that great because you know we haven't maintained the site. On the fishing side, it's like we address the hatchery from the place we grow the fish 
to the places you fish, whether you access the lake by boat or you're mm -hmm. shore fishing. And then there's dollars in there to actually manage the fishery. So we're really trying to focus on all of the components of what we do and not pick and choose based on, you know, what's in the worst shape or what a particular funding source can provide. And so I will just say it's a mishmash of funding sources that behind the scenes we match, knowing that what we need to provide what the public expects is a comprehensive program and comprehensive experience. And Commissioner, to that point, I would just note that, you know, in addition to the $118 million in the biennial budget um, for Get Out More, there's also $118 million just ended up working out to be the same yeah. amount yeah. Yeah. Um, in the capital <laughs> budget as well. And there's different emphases because to Commissioner Stroman's point, the funding, you know, has sort of different focuses or different um, constraints around it, but it's all for that overall modernizing those experiences. So. And then I'll just note kind of the third leg of this is um, we have looked at a number of fee increases as well, um, increases on the fishing license, increases on the park vehicle permit, and increases on um, watercraft registration and the AIS surcharge. The park increase that we proposed is the exact same one we proposed in 2021. It didn't get the watercraft one is essentially the same we proposed in 21 and two times before that that we didn't get. Um, fishing, it hasn't been raised since 2017 either, um, so we're due, and again, because it generates a different kind of revenue that we can use in a different way, what we're trying to make the case to is it's a small contribution that Minnesotans can make, and then we've got these other contributions that the state is making more generally, again, to round up the whole experience. So, Shannon, I don't know if there are other things you want to highlight. Um, Kind of on the budget overall, otherwise we can turn it over to Anne to yeah. introduce herself and <laughs> um, kind of her, her vision for the division and how we think we can work with Greater Minnesota. Yeah, why don't we do that? And then okay. I can always layer in or add any color commentary along the way. All right. Well, as you know, I've met most of you. I'm Ann Pierce and I'm the Parks and Trails Director. I've been with the DNR for over 25 years. Most of my work was with ecological and water resources, um, but I did a lot of work with Parks and Trails through that work because I was kind of focused on uh, systems level stuff, which obviously works in trails all have an integrated part of that. So, um, and I've, I've said this to a couple of groups in this group probably also, but one of the reasons that I really jumped at the chance to become Parks and Trails Director is because during my work with um, kind of the biodiversity side of things, I recognize that working with the people of Minnesota is really the most important thing and making sure that people have the experiences that really connect them to the outdoors and get them to a point where they really value and see what the importance of our systems are from recreational standpoint, but also our day-to-day -day lives. And so as I was looking at what Parks, and I've always been looking at what Parks and Trails was doing because that division was leading in a lot of things like partnering and um, doing a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And I really, that was a real um, priority for me. So I was really excited to be able to do this work and work with the people that are, that are doing this work. And I think as um, the commissioner has mentioned, there's a lot of things in this budget that are gonna be really good for the parks and trails system as a whole for the state of Minnesota and for all of Minnesota. And one of the things that I know as we meet together at various meetings, we all talk mm -hmm. about some of the things that we're seeing that have increased and changed on the landscape. And those include the number of visitors that we're seeing, which is so exciting and so um, really invigorating to see that we're getting more people out there recognizing what we have to offer them across the state. And also um, the length of when people are coming, because even though it's really cold out today, <laughs> <laughs> our year has changed, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it stays warmer into the fall longer than it has, and it warms up earlier in the spring. And so people are coming and expecting to have 
services when they come to our recreational areas, people that may not be those winter recreational people. Um, and so that I think is one of the reasons that, you know, this budget is really exciting because we can address some of that, not only serving the people that we wanna serve across the state, but also along with that, and along with our changing climate comes a growing need for the maintenance. We already have the maintenance needs, but as you put more people on those trails and into those systems, and as the weather goes up and up and down, up and down, um, our systems need more of that attention. And so I think this is really gonna be helpful for us to really move forward into the future and, and make a bridge to a different model that we're hoping to look at. The um, other thing I know that you had mentioned talking a bit about partnerships and um, obviously people here are very <clears throat> uh, up to speed on being creating great partnerships and things like that. But I do think one of the things that I've been extremely kind of envious of and impressed by when I came here was just this ongoing partnership through the legacy work that we're doing and how close it is and how um, very um, effective it is. And looking at creating that seamless system for the people who are using our recreational system, I think is really critical. And I think it's critical to inviting those new users because they probably don't have all the pieces of understanding of, oh, you're not here, you're here. And that's why this is happening. But it's so it's important for us to just make it as seamless and enjoyable and comfortable as possible for people. And I think that's something that um, the legacy group has really been working quite, I mean, your, your leaps and bounds ahead of where a lot of people are on this. And, um, you know, we know that people don't really care what system they're in. I don't care if I'm in a metro park or a state park or a regional park. I just like this park. <laughs> Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so if we can improve our, our infrastructure, yeah. then there'll be a better rack to yeah. Yeah. Exactly. reflect well on everyone. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think the governor's budget gives us the opportunity to keep moving forward on a lot of things that we've been moving forward on and really to enhance that aspect of it, to enhance the um, getting people to to feel comfortable experiencing what we have to offer. And I think that's really critical. I mean, people want to go to a place where they feel like they're safe for various reasons and feel like they have access to it and it's easy access to it. And so I think this is really gonna give us um, some resources to do that with. And, you know, I, I mean, obviously the legacy has a whole, piece in it of one of the four pillars where we're talking about working in partnerships, but a couple of things that I was like really impressed with when I started attending some of our um, joint meetings were the work we're doing with trying to figure out who is visiting their parks and what are they doing in their parks and how many people are coming and so that research piece that the group as a whole is looking at and feeding back and forth on ideas that others have and have tried and using that information, that back and forth to really grow what we can offer. I think the other piece that I just love is the um, art and park stuff that we're doing mm -hmm. is super exciting. Um, and I just think that that's really gonna be an opportunity to enhance what people experience at, in these systems and to make people feel like they belong in the systems. I think it's really gonna be a great piece that goes into it. And that's super exciting. And then just like the technical stuff where we're like have our joint webpage where people hopefully as we get it going and get it improving, people can go and look on that and see where everything is. And including the art. Including the art, right? right? And they have that all at one stop. They don't have to go from page to page to page and figure out what they're going to be doing and where they want to go. And so I just see this as a real opportunity to help us grow that further and keep moving ourselves. And I think that's, for me, that's super exciting. So 
And you know, we have a lot of connections too. I, I, I forget about all the connections, but I saw Sudan underground mine yeah. improvements are so, that was one of the coolest tours I've ever taken. I took it right in 2021 after things opened up again with the mask and the tour guide there was so awesome and amazing. Um, so when I saw the 14.4 million improvements, that's gonna be really great for that, but our Masabi Trail, which is a regional trail, yes. um, and we just funded um, rehabilitation for that trail piece to the mine because it was one of the original pieces of trail that we lay down. So that's a beautiful connection that's seamless. Right. We've got that at Shiprock Creek Campground yes, at Split yes. Rock with our Split Rock Wilds trails. And I was thinking too, Laverne Loop to Blue Mountain State Park. We've got the Otter Tail Trail connection to Maplewood State Park. So there's all these, again, seamless connections that no one knows, but our greater Minnesota regional parks and trails have impacts um, mm -hmm. with the state. And, and to that, just to add to that, Renee, one of the things that, that I'm really excited about within this package, too, is with that sort of mix of funding, one of the things that has been a huge challenge for, for us kind of throughout our um, public lands, but particularly, I think, in, in Parks and Trails is signage, wayfinding, mm -hmm. and not just kind of within <laughs> the, yeah. you know, the state trail or the state park, but to connect people to yeah. those other resources that you all are providing to create that seamless system. And, you know, what one element of that Get Out More initiative is to really enhance that wayfinding and get more modern signage out there, help people feel more comfortable because they know where they are, but also help with that connectivity. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I want to just take a moment and um, Bob Meyer has joined us, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. And so uh, as we get if people on legislative questions, he'll be um, here to chat about those too, but um, key person from our team. Uh, the one thing too, I just wanted to add because um, I don't think I emphasize this enough. And we have uh, one of the things I've heard from people is like, well, this is great, but it sounds like it's very recreation focused. And what about the resource piece? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other, you know, element here is there are dollars for that resource management and resource protection. And we don't want to forget about that piece yeah. of our mission. And um, it's, it's the piece that sort of gets overlooked. And so I think people assume we overlooked it in here, but we didn't. <laughs> And that's another piece that, you know, one of the reintroduce things and restore some habitat. And so that's a, a critical thing for our um, passionate about that. So I think that's exciting. It's also, I think, a great opportunity to further connect with the outdoor recreation system as a whole with, you know, regional, greater Minnesota regional parks and trails and, and metro and city tra trails and, and parks as well. You know, just even thinking about the, the bison reintroduction in um, kind of Southern Minnesota and making sure that where we have adjacent lands or adjacent resources, we've got the resources to partner with the local resources, if it's invasive species control or you know doing some um, climate adaptation kinds of of joint projects, and so I think there's there's a cool opportunity there too. So we want to make this conversational. So <laughs> <laughs> well, on that track of um, invasive species, one of the things that we brought into our system that was from the DNR is um, the Clay Clean Go that is now with the North American Base Species Management Association. Yep. Um, but they still have these products available on their website. If you're a member, you can use the graphics. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, keeping that branding throughout our outdoor recreational system is really going to be important in emphasizing. Um, the role that people play in moving the species yeah. and being able to recognize them. So, yeah. kudos to the DNR for bringing that to the forefront and making it accessible. So, um, I just hope that that continues in the state system that I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like even in Rock County, I know that we've worked with you guys. So, one of our lakes that we have, Cedar Lake. We have a campground on one side and you've got a DNR access on the other. Mm -hmm. So we've actually worked with you guys to get CD3 stations yeah. yes. in place at a couple of so we've got one at Clearwater Pleasant that we've worked with the city, the DNR, so the water and us. 
And we've seen great success with that one there. The one at Cedar Lake is we've done them on both accesses. So those are other things when you you know kind of just helping mitigate what's going on because we've got those custom wrapped as well, saying, hey, this is what it is. Yeah. So I don't know, you know those, those have been great partnerships on our end. And then uh, you mentioned some other part of like programming wise, connecting people out. You know, one of the things that I've always been kind of curious about, we do quite a bit of programming on Rod County side and we're increasing as much as we can, but the DNR has a lot of great programs, but those programs primarily are held within the state parks. Has there ever been any kind of talk about being able to work with you guys like the iCamp and the iPaddle, some of these, uh, your outdoor, becoming an outdoor woman programs where we could actually work with you guys to get some of those programs even into the regional parks. So I don't know what the opportunities for that would be because I know like on our end, we're pretty fortunate, but there are other systems that they don't have programming staff, but if they're able to work with the DNR and say, hey, can we bring this program into our regional park? That's going to now offer up some more programming opportunities, more connection, and partnering together there too. So that was one thing that I was kind of curious about. It's a good question. I, I just I'm going to suspect that uh, it's it'll be a question of capacity for us yeah. too. That you know we need built the capacity yeah. to cover our own uh, spaces, but that's not to say through partnership mm -hmm. we could not potentially grow that. And I mean, you know, the bow program is relying on volunteers. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's a conversation. Yeah. Maybe even sharing the curriculum so that right. if Correct. there is capacity, because you do have staff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if there's training opportunities, right. like I could send the staff to yeah. like a training class for becoming an outdoor yeah. woman or the iCamp or the yeah. iPaddle, you know, that there's yeah. those training courses available that we get some staff to to get trained, get the curriculum and be able to bring that into our system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, it's possibly revenue for you guys too. We <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great idea. I mean, we can we can look into that. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. terms of parks and trails, yeah. and then that yeah. with the fish and wildlife. Yeah, and yeah, more of that kind of stuff that we can do. I mean, people, a lot of people think it's you know just a park, right? Yeah. Yeah. Regional park, state park. Right. Why can't I do this here? So. Helping them experience those things would be great. Yeah. Right. And we always talk about that it's a balance between access and preservation, right? Yeah. Right. So if I don't allow people to access to see some of the great work we're doing on the natural resource management of it, right. then what's the point in doing it? You know, so we kind of got to get through both of those avenues. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to mention too on your comment with the public water access on the CD3 stations. Um, we're super supportive of those partnerships yeah. and one of the barriers that we're aware of is frankly just the space that some Correct. of our accesses yeah. um you know we ask people i mean we want to make those tools available we ask people to you know when you take your boat out pull over and clean drain dry dispose and sometimes you might be blocking yeah. <laughs> yeah. the experts that try to launch and so that's part of this initiative again it's we don't want to just fix the ramps in the same configuration they are we want to really modernize them to make them um, function in terms of stormwater runoff prevention keeping our waters clean make sure that there are spaces for cd3 stations make sure there's spaces for people to pull over and not walk the ramp and, and do what we're asking them to do i mean if the space doesn't facilitate it people aren't going to do it and so that's kind of a, that's a great example of how we're envisioning you know a boat ramp is not just a boat ramp right. it serves multiple resources yeah, and the storage for those in the winter too so we have all three of those the three that are in the county we actually have at our facility during the winter so okay. that way they're coming in and we're Perfect. able to store them yeah, yeah. Brad, i just want to make sure the people online are being recognized do they have questions or yeah i'm watching it they're, there's none right now at this point okay so I've got one that came from a constituent, well, came from Bemidji. And I think they can get the money through us. Audrey can address that. <laughs> um, she's in the hall. Is Lake Bemidji State Park bathrooms on the fix-it list? Uh, <laughs> really all over. Yeah, I know. I actually, um, I don't have my whole budget binder, but I have this letter from Representative Cross all about the uh, Lake Bemidji State Park bathroom because yes. every time we're talking about this, I'm like, and see, this is an example. Yeah. Every one of you has someone in your district or some facility, right? This is why you have to pay yes. Um, and you can just speak about where it is, spe specifically where that facility is on the list, perhaps. Yeah. If, I mean, it is on the list and it is a priority for us. So, you know, we 
And there's a lot of bathrooms. Bathrooms. Yeah, there's a lot of bathrooms, but that one we know about. We've heard about. Um, and I, I mean, I was staring at that too. Well, when we got that letter, because I knew exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Popped up on my screen. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. And I think you know whether whether it's you know near the top top or it's down a little further on the list. We're not getting through any list right, right now, right? Yeah. And the list just keeps getting longer, and so things get pushed. And so, I mean, that's the other thing is even if it's not on the top and it might not get here, the only way it's going to get there before it hits crisis is, is yeah, yeah. is you know, unfortunately, we're putting, we're addressing the things that literally aren't functioning, right? That are broken yeah. first, and we need to get beyond the things that are broken yes. and to the things that give people that kind of reaction yeah yeah <laughs> um you know and, and actually we are, we are waiting for more guests from your they're in the hallway it, oh they are okay yeah. good so i don't know if they were here or not i do have a, another question though related to their work and to our work um i see in here you know there's 1.2 million dollars for the local regional grant programs as you may know this is i just explained to everybody sort of making sure that there's funding that goes into that is a, yeah. is a high priority for us because we also recognize not everybody can be a legacy park yeah. track yeah. um or designated and so very you know very excited about 1.2 million you know i know there's money coming in from lccmr but you know um, you would be the only person excited about 1.2 million most would on it I you well i <laughs> No, it's, it's always a good start. I guess my question is too, because we're expecting a bonding bill, you know, this year and next year. What can we do to continue to inch that up? Because, you know, again, I know that there's huge needs, you know, for your new presence. We're also anticipating, you know, that there's going to be a bonding bill this year, and ideally a bonding bill next year so that they can get back on cycle. Yeah. What can we do to make sure that, um, you know, we're getting additional funding and that that, that number can continue to, to grow mm -hmm. for the, those programs. Well, and others can chime in. I mean, it's, we're sold, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> and um, I often, uh, Renee, I often cite the conversation with you or Sarah Zelli and I had um, mm -hmm. soon after he and I came into these roles as we were talking about, in that case, legacy, but we're having this conversation and mm -hmm. we're like, why are we all talking about who could stand with less money? We all yeah. need more money. So right. that's yeah. the conversation we should be having. And I think, you know, to that point, we're we're on board with that. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, the power of your organization is that in greater Minnesota, it, you know, I mean, there's a lot of interest in that. There's constituents. And so having conversations with legislators about the specific needs and if those grant dollars you know were available um what would that yield um for those experiences you know in various parts of, of the state and why it's important to have that i just wanted to interject too on the experiences and you talked about that modernizing that experience with signage that's consistent where have you seen that done well can you can you point to a community? Is it Duluth or, or where is it that that is really being done well? Because in the crazy area, we're just starting that, mm -hmm. and we have legacy um, designation with one of the regional parks. So we wanted these are things that we're just yeah. starting with. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to have those models. And where have you seen that? Can you speak to that, or I, is that still something that's coming together? I think it's still something. Yeah that's coming together. I can just give one personal example because I found it super useful and I'm usually the person if the signage is not good, I get lost <laughs> um, or I spend a lot of time staring at the map trying to figure out where I am and where I'm going. Um, but uh, I live in the West Metro, so I live right along the Loose Line State Trail, which is a DNR trail. It connects into numerous regional trails through three rivers, and there are fabulous maps along those trails that demonstrate how state trails connect to regional trails. And um, it's I, so interesting because we just had our park and rec crazy area park and rec ask about signage, and so that's what I can do about it. I go to the loose line now and take pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can sort of ink, we can see what that is, yeah. you know, and develop our own coloring system. And yeah. And then I think it's the Dakota Rail Regional Trail that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
having Mike's cat guys. They yeah. do a good job. Yeah, they do a good job. Okay. So I'll have to take pictures next time. Yeah. But there, there are probably others. Mm -hmm. I've just been on that one recently. Right, because I think uh, it so, is that experience. It totally is. You know, that's exactly mm -hmm. what we, we have found mm -hmm. in conversations with this experience and that seamless act. Yeah, mm -hmm. good experience. Yeah. If you were here longer and it was warmer, I would actually take you around St. Paul because the Grand Round is oh, also yeah, really well. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, there's places like down by Sweet Hollow where yes. you could just branch out yeah. in about 15 different directions. And if you didn't have signs, you'd really be lost. Yeah. yeah. And end up in a junkyard. The nice part about that is they even have them on the road. So you'd yeah. be like, oh, this parking lot, I can get to this, this, and this. Yeah. 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 And that, so. Well, thank you very much for those questions and res being respectful of your time. Um, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate the conversation and partnership and, and look forward to the continuing. Well, yeah, thank you for stopping by and what's a very busy day. So hopefully you, you found it okay. <laughs> yeah, great directions. I had a, somebody who I'd be here. She okay. said, I can't explain it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Bob. Good to see you. I get to play mini I get to play IT and It's one of those things. Yeah. We are not. We are not. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Very good. So let's see the transition. Uh, let me transition into our uh, next presenters. Uh, we have some more staff at the ENR. This is a good specific grant staff that are coming. We have Audrey Broderick, Sarah Winterberg, and Daniel Goldberg. So, uh, welcome. We'll probably have you guys do the changes that will be in so we'll recommend cases. Sure. Um, once well, they get settled back in, you know, and thanks for taking the time to have a good day with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for emailing us. Yep, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Audrey Mallory, and I work with the division on the local TARP grant programs primarily. And Sarah Winneberg um, is one of our newest employees, and she works with us on the um, local projects, LWCF, but primarily on the um, DNR or the Legacy Trail projects as well. I'm Dan Bowler. I work for the DNR as well, and I administer the trail grant programs. I'm Sarah. <laughs> I took her thunder away. Um, so I, I think you just wanted a little kind of a brief uh, overview of the programs that we have, and then you know we and some tips on completing applications maybe, and then. Um, we can answer any questions that you have, but I'll um, start off with the programs. Can everyone hear? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, the programs that I work with primarily are the Outdoor Recreation Grant Program, and that's the local grant program, local park grant program, um, and then the Natural and Scenic Area Grant Program. That's um, for acquisition of natural and scenic areas. So we're in the midst of our application round right now. We post the RFPs in the fall of each year. The application deadline for our programs, the Outdoor Rec and Natural and Scenic is March 31st um, each year. So the Outdoor Recreation Grant Program can fund the acquisition and development of local park facilities. It's primarily you know, any, any type of park facility that's non-motorized. So your athletic courts, picnic facilities, campgrounds, boat accesses, and so forth. These programs require, that program in particular, requires a 50% match. Um, the match can actually be donations, cash, um, or force account equipment and labor. So that's a little bit different than when, what Dan's going to have. But those requirements are with our federal dollars, so th that's what that program is. Um, the grant limit has been increased to 300000 so for a project of 600,000, we're kind of incrementally increasing it as we get more funding available. Our federal funding has grown a little bit. 
um, for that program. Our federal dollars come from the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant program. Uh, most people refer to that as Lock On or LWCL. And that's been uh, a program that's been in existence since 1965, but that has been reauthorized <clears throat> and we're seeing additional funding. So we're seeing about two and a half million a year of federal funds. And then we also get state funds from uh, the Environmental Natural Resources Press Fund, um, some lottery and lieu dollars, as well as some general fund dollars. And then the Natural and Scenic Area Grant Program has the, the differences is it's acquisition only. Um, when we when someone comes in with an acquisition, we can also do some betterment activities um, and signage to just kind of stabilize the the natural and scenic area. So that's just a small piece of it. It does have to be acquisition. It's really meant to, um, and that's a statewide program. They both are. It's meant to draw out those um, unique areas of acquisition. A lot of times they might be bluff land or shoreland, um, unique parcels that are of natural or scenic significance, but not state significance. That program has a match uh, or a grant limit of 500,000. So for a, a million dollar project. And that funding is also LWCF for the federal funding. We use that sometimes as well as the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund dollars. That also does require a match uh, and donations can be part of that. It's more limited because of land acquisition. It has to be a donation from the landowner of a value of the property um, or some of the betterment activities. If it's to stabilize the property, you might have someone putting up the fencing or clearing out a site. So those are the basics of those programs. I'll let uh, Dan touch on the brand programs. <clears throat> or trails. Yeah, so I've mentioned three different programs. Uh, the first is a local trail connections grant program. And that is a program that provides funding to local communities. And, and the focus is really to, to connect people and communities to their uh, to significant public areas like uh, other parks or other trail systems um, or natural areas. Uh, the um, maximum amount is $250,000. Um, all my grant programs um, are eligible to local government units. So cities, townships, et cetera. Um, that one has a 25% match required, a cash match. We do not accept in kind, it needs to be a cash match. Uh, a regional trail grant program is the second grant program. And that one really provides funding for uh, regionally significant trails outside this, the seven county metro area. Um, uh, Duluth Trippers, for example, Cannon Valley Trail, uh, Lake Obegon, those are large regional trails which can be funded to this grant program. That has a maximum award of three hundred thousand uh, dollars. Those two applications are both due at the end of March. Um, we do have an opportunity for applicants to send in a draft uh, application that would be reviewed, and we have comments that we provide back to them before the application deadline. Uh, and my third program is the Federal Recreational Trail Grant Program. That's federal funding, so we need a twenty-five percent match, but it needs to be non-federal. Um, that uh, will fund um, a variety of different trail projects, um, trail development, trail restoration, trail maintenance, um, trailhead development. Um, it also provides funding for purchase of equipment, which is unusual. Um, the maximum award is uh, $200,000 for trail work and $75,000 for equipment grants. Um, in that particular application, there's a lot of local clubs that will work with an agency, a local government unit to help to you know, submit the funding, submit for funding. Uh, those applications are due at the end of February, the 24th, but again, there's a review period that I have. People can send an application in for review and comment. Um, all my grants will provide funding for acquisition and development. Um, the caveat with the acquisition is um, 
sometimes if, if you're going to purchase uh, uh, or try to acquire either fee title or an easement, that can take a, a relatively long period of time. And a lot of these grant programs are funded for two or three years. And, and so sometimes we get a grant kind of premature to, to when they are really to, ready to go and develop it. So, uh, then is the equipment mostly rumors for trails? It's, it's for trail maintenance as yeah. well, but yeah. And, and because of the federal pile of money, the uh, Buy America requirements um, are in place, and which means the equipment needs to be built with U.S. steel or iron and built in the U.S. And there's a lot of rumors that don't yeah, that are, qualify yeah. for that. There are a few yet in the state that do, or in different states that do. Um, Wisconsin has small rumors that uh, Arrowhead makes those in Tucker in Oregon. Tucker, yeah. yeah. And so there's a few. Um, but you need to meet that requirement, and that's becoming more and more difficult. That's yes, because the equipment to pull the rumors typically to find that all American steel and build America is mm -hmm. almost impossible. Yeah, I mean, John Deere, Kubota, uh, a lot of the common ones don't uh, meet that requirement. Uh, so it, it has really limited our equipment grant opportunities. And there's other states, the FRTP program is a, a, a national program. In some states have actually eliminated the equipment portion of it because they, they can't they can't it. meet that requirement. And there's no like just the state, like we did not the, the regional trail, the local trails, mm -hmm. no equipment can go through there, so it's not a big deal, correct? Correct. Just for yeah, Have you heard anything? I third I thought I'd heard at one point on the federal side that they were gonna kind of loosen some of that where it would just be the like, symbol in the US. There are waivers that have been submitted to help ease the restrictions mm -hmm. on that. Um, I haven't heard any kind of final decision on whether or not they've been accepted or not yet. And I know for our applications, just on, you know, when we're giving guidance out, we, we do always encourage people to contact us to talk through mm -hmm. their projects. We also, like Dan indicated, we have, um, we will review their application prior to the deadline and provide comments and feedback either by email or if they want to meet uh, on a team's meeting. So applicants that do take um, advantage of that definitely are more competitive, you know. So we, we do have a pre-application deadline of like, I think March 10th or yeah. so, yeah. that if they get it to us by then, we'll review it, we'll give them comments, and then, you know, basically whatever they submit at the application deadline is the final application because these programs are all competitive. We do not, uh, we fund, we have been funding around 35%, which is significantly more than probably five, ten, five years ago, we were, we were really at about 15%. So that is, um, the change has come with, with the federal funding LWCF, but also with the change from LCCMR that started funding the grant programs with the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund dollars. It used to be historically all of our state funding came from the Future Resources Trust Fund, the cigarette tax money. And when that went away, you know, we weren't getting any funding from um, LCCMR until they made a determination probably five or six years ago more that they started funding some recreational facilities more. So I think, you know, the last six years or more, well, I guess they do it annually now. It just seems like six years. So mm -hmm. about six years, though, they funded our program or are considering funding our program. We're in the bill again this year. So, and that's actually, that's funding both the local trail outdoor rec and natural and scenic area grant programs. So what what are like what what makes something rise into that 35%? Is it a better project? Are they doing a better job? You know, I mean we will we have our newsletter going out this week. We'll remind people of that opportunity for the pre-application review, but you know. What are some of the things that make things stand out? Are you looking at geographic balance types of thing, you know, types of projects, or is it really case by case? It, it really is case by case. We don't um, distribute the funding geographically necessarily. Although when we put the maps together to present our recommendations, mm -hmm. it's quite a spread because we're funding 
Yeah, I don't know about 90 projects with yeah. FRTB. Yeah. So it get, it gets dispersed. Um, certainly people that fill out a complete application and legible. That's why it's really important to come in um, and address all the concerns. Yeah. Um, because almost, you know, almost any project can be competitive. You know, we're looking at, but there are some things in the state, our, our programs, the park programs, a lot of the criteria are taken out of the state comprehensive outdoor recreation plan or score. So obviously, you know, we're looking at redevelopment to improve safety and accessibility, welcoming environment, and all the things that we ask for in the application um, that can make your, your application more competitive. You know, acquisition of, of significant areas along lakes and shorelines and things like that is also um, something that can be a little bit more competitive, but in reality, we actually don't see many acquisitions in the outdoor recreation grant program. They usually come through the natural and scenic. So, um, you know, redevelopment can be a little bit more competitive than new development, but if new development is in a rapidly growing area, you know, it can kind of balance it. So I don't know if that's a great answer, but but the, the most important is, is is reach out to us and mm -hmm. and have that review because a lot of times it's um, some pretty simple things that they can do to strengthen their application on their map or how we read it, you know, and how they're addressing accessibility and so forth that can make them more competitive. And with trail projects, uh, some more things, you know, read the application, make sure you follow the uh, directions. Um, but for trails, you know, it's a little bit different system. So you're looking at possibly crossing other properties that you may not have in ownership. And we're looking for something that's a trail design that's fairly well developed. It doesn't need to have a full design or anything like that, but it needs to be a little bit stronger than a, a line, you know, on a napkin saying we want to go from here to here. So do some research, make sure if you are working on properties that are not under ownership of the LGU, you know, reach out to the community to make sure that they're, they're on board with that. Because a lot of times, like I said, the acquisition or easement process can take a long time and the grant may expire. So kind of do your due diligence before you even apply. You know, have the trail lined up where you want to talk with the community, make sure you've got their support. For FRTP in particular, uh, we break down the funding between motorized and non-motorized recreational user groups. And it's really important to have support letters from those recreational user groups that you're providing the trail for or the money for. So get that community support. And the FRTP grants, we've had a number of instances with our Greater Minnesota grants where now just due to delays, they got those funds first and they're going to expire before the mm -hmm. project gets started. Mm -hmm. It's always been relatively easy, hasn't it, to extend those FRTP grants? I've never seen an instance where a community hasn't been able to. With FRTP, we have the luxury of being able to extend about five years because it's a five-year program. So we can mm -hmm. we can extend projects for that level of time. Um, our grant agreements are generally a two-year contract, but then we can do amendments to extend those out. Um, but yeah, FRTB has the flexibility to, to extend it beyond those initial two years. Some of our other funding sources don't, we don't have that flexibility. So our runway is five years, but the contract's two. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, we'll yeah. Amend it, okay. extend it out. But I think it is important to understand the difference, you know, the, the FRTP and we have some flexibility if we're, we have a federally funded local project that we can extend it, but our lottery and lieu money and general fund money is two years, start to finish, yeah. July 1st to June 30th, two years. That is not much time. So what we're really focusing on in the applications and when we send out the materials is for this application deadline of March 31st, it's really for projects that you're gonna construct next year in 2024, start to finish. You know, um, and because our grants aren't that huge, you know, they're focusing on, on something a little bit smaller. So it is tangible. Um, after we get our applications March 31st, we go through that review and competitive process. Um, and we're typically able to make awards, getting it all the way up and down the, the, the department um, in June. 
But after that point, we have to do the environmental and um, archaeological and historical reviews, and that can take some time. Um, so, you know, while people will come to us, I got off a call today, it's like, well, we'd really like to start this summer. Well, then, you know, our, our funding is not what you're looking for because we can't do that, you know, and, but nor should it be for a project that's, they're looking to construct in 2026. So it, it's really projects that are fairly ready to go, just the final environmental and CHIPO, and they have the funding in place, including the match, so that they can hit the ground running um, during their one full construction season and just the tail end of um, the following year. It's very tight, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have a little bit of flexibility with our trust fund money. We that That is for three years, like the legacy money is three years, but that lottery in lieu and um, general fund money is not, so. Because we'll have a few more extended this year. It does look that way, yeah. I know too, but I'm expecting some of the last minute goals. Yeah. I mean, th those projects have been moving along pretty well. And, but I think we're seeing um, with, with some of the legacy projects and some of the outdoor rec ones too, some um, significant delays in the archeological and historical mm -hmm. reviews. Um, we're seeing more phase two surveys, or I've got one, an outdoor rec, you know, it, it's avoidance or phase three collection, you know, so that can really be um, a delay and um, a, huge expense. a huge expense. So, um, but the flexibility with the legacy funds, natural uh, environmental funds and federal ones is we can also go to the legislature and get an extension, mm -hmm. um, but they don't typically do that for the general fund or lottery. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for coming in. We appreciate yep. the partnership. And as always, if you have questions, they don't have issues reaching out. You reach out directly, especially in the pre-application portion of the grant apps and, and things like that. So um, I do just want to note that uh, some of you may be receiving some emails from you guys and some reorganization. Uh, it was my name as yep. well with you. Um, so um, just watch for those. Um, and I know I'll be in contact with Audrey and Sarah over a couple projects. So. Yeah, I, I, I think to know that we did post a couple new positions. So um, hopefully, you know, the first time will be the charm um, through the process and we'll be hiring two additional, additional staff people. So um, we'll, but in the meantime, you know, we're here to answer any questions for everyone. And I have to say, as a department chair, I mean, there's never. Thank ever, you. It is so good to be able to call and say, oh, "Okay, talk me through how this is going to work," because I'm lost. Um, they're you're just amazing to work. So, oh, thank you. Really so I think fabulous. We have time for one more quick question. Jessica Peterson from Duluth. Um, mostly, I just want to say thank you because we are a recipient of nearly all of these categories <laughs> of funds over the years. Yep. I know that we have grown you know, curveball and city is <laughs> and all of the things in between. And your team has handled our questions so well. The opportunity for death reviews is fantastic. I know we've got one coming your way quite soon. Um, so just for anyone else who is wondering how this all works, um, to Renee's point, it works. And it's thanks to your good work. So thank you. Thank you. I, that just does remind me just really quickly that we do have one other program, which is the National Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Grant Program. It's actually a national oh. program, <laughs> but Duluth was the recipient of Lincoln Park um, has a grant and, and others, but um, that application just closed. It's run through the National Park Service. It's a natu national application, but we have to solicit applications. Um, it's for urban areas, but it's 30,000 and above um, with poverty levels, census tract levels in the target community of, of 20% or 10% greater than the statewide average. Those grants are for up to $10 million grants. So 
the, the, the smallest is 500,000 now, largest is 10. Oh, so no, it, you got the maximum at that time at 750,000. They, they have a lot of money and they haven't been giving it out. So like our last round, it was $5 million grants in Rochester and Minneapolis and St. Paul each got a grant. So there's a lot of groups on course, that. Of course, Mike grant. Yeah. You're a contortionist by the time you get <laughs> So yeah, that just reminded me of that program in case you're out on our website and it's like, huh, they didn't mention that. Well, it is always kind of a secret because the National Park Service is like, oh, we're accepting applications now. It's like, oh, great. Okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, flip it around, but. We appreciate when you email us, and I know you hit yeah. me and I think some of the others, and we try to do this we can to make sure we're getting it out to our members. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Hey, so what's Renee's Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to introduce Renee Madison, uh, the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota uh, Regional Parks and Trails Commission. And she's here to provide us an update on where they're, excuse me, where they're at. I'll take it away, Renee. Shoot, what a busy day. <laughs> well, first and foremost is the 2022 policy and planning report. Um, it's available online, of course, but you can't feel it. Um, yeah. I will just point out the cover is really cool. If you're a tactile person like I am, really appreciate it. Uh, but in here is, of course, the report on um, the projects that have been awarded for uh, FY24. The FY25 application cycle will open on or around April 1, whatever that first Monday in April is, and it will close on or around July 31st, whatever the final day of July is, that's not a weekend date. So there's plenty of time to fill out an application. Um, in this round, we were fortunate that we were able to award $11.4 million, and there will be more like 12 million um, to, do, to award for FY25. And if we're successful in lottery and lieu, there's going to be another million dollars on top of that. Um, I guess it would be for FY25. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we need to make sure that gets passed. More money, more money. In fact, if it's passed for FY24 and 25, there'd be $2 million more in FY25. So, the bottom line for that is um, think about your projects, get applications in. There would be nothing more awful than having these funds available and not having the appropriate projects to award to get up to that that limit so think about what you have um the commissioners had a meeting last week and um, this is our time of year when we talk about how we want to change funding applications and as i tell every legislator and every person that i meet with the commission has the grace that we can be nimble we're not a huge bureaucracy there are two of us um and we aren't even staff, so there's zero bureaucracy in this organization, and the commissioners are always willing to look at what we're doing. Uh, does it make sense? Can we make it better? How can we improve our process? So um, after the commission meeting last week, um, a decision was made to look at how we can structure projects so that archaeological surveys can be a part of a grant award. Now, of course, with an archaeological survey, it has to be we have to do that with a project before a project is started, right? So this would be something that would be a pre-planning sort of award. Gina, what, where would, uh, where could a tribal consultation fit into that as an added piece? Well, right now we don't require TIPO consultation. We strongly encourage it. Okay. So it's not fitting in there yet, but I suspect we'll probably get to the point where that is required also. Um, mm -hmm because it should be, right? We've just recently, the last two years, have said we're, we're strongly recommending SHIPO consultation. So I would suspect that we're going to go that route. And then that would include probably that funding. So what this would mean is, you know, when you, you go for bonding and you've got a big project and the state gives you $1.3 million for design. So this is a similar sort of look at a project. 
Um, and again, it's not all fleshed out. We came up with some great ideas. The commissioners have to see this in the next month and approve it. Joe and I need to translate what happened with that meeting into what we heard and what we think we heard to make sure everybody's on board. But it would be a certain amount of dollars and the project would have to be then for us in its final form within a certain number of years. So you can get the archaeological survey work done well in advance. We could help you with some of that cost because it's gone up alarmingly. Um, and then you could come back and, and apply for a grant for that particular project. So it's all in recognizing that things are changing and surveys are taking longer and the cost on those has dramatically increased. So we want to recognize that and make it a better partnership for all of you. The other thing that we're looking at is um, contingency. Now, costs, um, some of the projects that we're going to be looking at extending the deadlines for were uh, estimated out before COVID and supply chain issues and construction costs and projects are, have shortfalls. So um, we're looking at a contingency amount that would be in your match. Uh, that was probably, that was a pretty brilliant suggestion from one of the commissioners to not put it in the project cost, but to put it in the match. So now you're looking at the match realistically, knowing that you have to come up with those funds. It's a softening point. You still have to use the dollars, but at least you'd be able to use those as a part of your match, those contingency funds. So we think that that will help as well. Um, so any questions about it? that piece? Okay, so just want you to, to know that, um, you know, we hear from people a lot and we take that into consideration and we try to make the process better every year. It's not static by any, any stretch, it's very dynamic. Other things that are coming up, you've probably heard me talking about ad, ad nauseum, but that would be our mountain bike trail development guidelines that kicked off exactly almost four years ago. We issued the RFP. Um, I wish I could say it was all related to COVID, but very little of it was. It was just a really busy contractor that, responded to the RFP, that was Rock Solid Construction, who I think most of you know, they did a great job. Um, I always used to tell Aaron Rodgers, he was my second favorite Aaron Rodgers, but in the last year or two, I've told him he's my first, he's moved back up the chain. Yeah. Um, that's his company. <laughs> but we are at the design stage. So the document that we originally envisioned was going to be a much smaller piece of development guidelines. And to put it in perspective, the last time a comprehensive manual was developed for mountain bike trail development was in 2017. So there's a lot to happen. This is intended to be from A to Z. This is how you do it. It's for land managers, whoever else want to build sustainable trails and don't know where to start. So this guide walks you through the entirety of it. And we envision a few appendices coming in future years that will augment what we're doing here. It's going to be about 300 pages. We had envisioned it at about maybe 100, so it's grown. Um, IMBA, the International Mountain Biking Associate, Bicycle Association, has partnered with us. So they put money into the project, as did Rock Solid along the way. Um, and they put a lot of staff time into this, reviewing it, as well as uh, a copy editor. So the project has a lot of partners. Um, it's in design. We expect that we'll have hard copies printed sometime in March of 2023. And we'll do a big um, unveil at the Capitol because we want to get as much out of this as we can publicity wise. It will be free as a downloadable piece on both the IMBO website and our website. We want it to be out there. We want people to be able to access this and use this guide. So IMBO's agreed to put it on their site as well. They have a greater reach than Greater Minnesota, obviously. And for our purposes, we will be printing copies for our partners in Minnesota. So if you want a printed copy, we plan to make that investment so that all of you um, or anyone who asks can get a free copy printed because that's a little handier to have in the field. Um, IMBA will sell theirs on their website uh, for a nominal fee. They, they have a quick print process. They'll upcharge it slightly, but we have an agreement they're not going to be making a ton of money on this. Um, so far and wide, this guy is going to be available. And we're pretty excited about that. It's really kind of cool. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So the difference between guidelines and mandates, right? Yeah. So um, if we have a dual traverse designated legacy asset, we have new guidelines in place, we seek additional funds for trail improvements, et cetera. Where do these guidelines fit as far as uh, required 
There's right. nothing required. It's not prescriptive. Okay. It's simply giving you the tools to build a trail to the newest standards that are recognized in the industry. And so this includes bridge widths and factoring in through wheel bikes. Yeah, so the whole nine yards. And we expect also that um, we can update this document then over time. But those appendices came up because we wanted to do more about how, to, how can we help partners know how to spec out costs for it? That was going to be a huge piece. It's become a smaller piece now because it's all on whack, but we expect we can get back to that. We also don't have a real robust section there on e-bikes and um, a-bikes, <laughs> accessible bikes. There, it's mentioned, but we need to flesh that out more. So that'll be the appendices coming, but it, it is its own section. So we're not telling you you have to do this, but they're really good development guidelines. And if you want to build a trail, it's going to hold up over time. And they have to be really cool, some really cool features. We think you should use this. Okay. Oh, you know, Joe and I don't have the capacity or the knowledge to go out and look at your trail and say, eh, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we think it'll be helpful. The other thing is, um, and Anne alluded to it, is the streetlight research. It's up on our website. If you go in and see your, you know, your information in real time, parks are done. That was a pretty easy lift with um, you know, the shape files. Uh, trails are proving to be much more challenging, but that work is scheduled to be wrapped up in June. So we're going to have a meeting in March where we can review what's been done so far and decide if more needs to be done. The commissioners have been pretty um, vocal about this is great work, and it was a two-year contract that's coming out of the coordination on, among partners' dollars. So it's not coming out of the commission's budget or DNRs or Metropolitan Council Parks, regional parks. It's coming out of that 1% off the top of legacy and parks and trails, which in this next biennium is going to be about a million three. Um, and we need to spend those dollars wisely. So we would like to see this research extended. We'll be having conversations about that because Streetlight keeps updating what they're doing and getting better. So we can all learn a lot more about our parks, but you'll see, you know, we keep updating the demographics. So you're gonna see really good information about that. And for facilities that were designation eligible at the time we started this, those facilities are in here too. So if you have a facility that's not yet, um, designated but you had already filled out an application two years ago you're included in that as well so um, anyone who comes in is going to be able to access that information any questions about anything no i guess not here and brad you don't have any online all right. I had problems accessing your plan. It might have been my browser, but you guys might want to check the link. Mm. I'm just saying it because I'm just remembering. So I was trying to pull it up when I was writing testimony the other day, and I'm like, it's not working, but I use Firefox, and sometimes that can. That's not the friendliest, but yeah, thanks. We'll check yeah. that out. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Now back to me. Yes, Renee. And yeah, we'll move back to Elizabeth for some tips and tricks. Okay. And Legislative oh. talk. Okay, well, we're, we're coming around to the end here and uh, appreciate all of you who've been hanging on both in line and in person. We've been covering a lot of information. We're taping this just in case you need to go back and get a refresher. So I want to um, kind of talk about a little bit of tips and tricks about what's next. What are you going to do, whether you're watching on that camera thing that, that I will that's looking at me or whether you're here in person. Um, yeah, I'm too fascinated by that. Oh, <laughs> it's the coolest ever. thing ever. Um, so what do we need you to today and this session? So our message from legislators is pretty simple. If you're here today, before you leave, make sure you only need to grab, you don't need to give the policies to legislators. That's for you to keep track of what we're working on. You can grab some extra if you want. Do grab the handouts and bring them with you, grab a couple, okay? Because what we want you to do is today, again, whether you're in person or you're gonna be working by email and phone if you're watching us from afar is to reach out to your legislators. And kind of there's some basic message. You know, if, if the sort of beginning and end, the always important message is how important parks and trails are to your community, you know, how vital they are. There are some people like we walked into Representative Kozlowski's office this morning. She knows the parks and trails are in Duluth. So she knows how important they are. Not every legislator is going to be like that. So you need to be making that case after you introduce yourself, of course, um, that uh, um, 
you know, but why these are so important. Then the next thing we need to be talking about is greater correction trials deserve fair, equitable treatment, especially compared to you know, metropolitan parks and trails. Um, regional parks and trails are an extremely important bridge between local and state parks and trails. They're close to home, but they're bigger than your neighborhood park. And, you know, we've got 80 counties, hundreds of cities, and almost half the state's population. Um, so our regional parks and trails deserve more. And our citizens deserve that same kind of close to home amenities that people who are living in the metro receive. Your metro folks like that, so do our folks. And quite frankly, they, it goes both ways. I, I'm sure that all of you who have parks and trails out there have people that come up from the metro area. I mean, some more than others. I'm sure they're open running, you know, Duluth probably at the Quarry Park and some of the folks, you know, in, in that direction as well. But, you know, it goes both ways. So we really need our legislators' support to preserve and expand fund levels. What we also want you to do is talk about our specific bill. Again, there's handouts here and we will send electronic versions out to all of you. Um, we want them to support the funding for SF 527 and HF 873 that provides the $500,000 to the commission. Um, you know, again, Metropolitan Parks receives operation and maintenance funding on average of $10 million a year or more, a year, $10 million a year for their operations. We're just asking for half a million so that more grant money can go out to our parks and trails. Mm -hmm. Not a big ask. A lot of inequities there. We don't begrudge the metro counties. We love metro parks. But, you know, we, we, we're looking for $500,000 a year. Drop in the state budget. Please help us. Um, what I would also, a specific thing I'm asking you to do is, in the Senate, you are only allowed five authors per bill. And we have lined up on there a combination of um, Democratic and Republican legislators. We've got House Child, we've got McEwen, we've got, I uh, can't remember who else is on there, but uh, Lang, you know, so we've got five across the state. We also, in the House though, you have almost unlimited authors. And right now we have three. We have um, Liz Lagarde, Luke Frederick from Mankato, and Jeff Grant from St. Peter. We want more, both Democrats and Republicans. So hand the legislator that handout and just say to them, and I actually have copies of the bill in my purse if anybody wants it, um, say to them, hey, will you sign on to this bill? We did that with Robert Kozlowski this morning. Hopefully she, she's signing on. They can sign on to the bill after the fact. We need more voices, both Democrat and Republican, on that bill. So if you do one thing today when you're talking to your House legislator, ask them to put their name on that bill. Senate, ask them to support it as it moves forward. So um, also ask them to help stop the restrictions on the LCCMR proposal. Um, again, Greater Minnesota doesn't have the same access to the same funds as the Metro or DNR. LCCMR has been a great resource. The 50% match makes it really tough in some situations. So, you know, bring that down or move it, maybe put it to 25% and ask them to partner with other rural legislators on this. And then again, so that's kind of the main messages. Close out the day with, again, how important are parks and trails to your community? Now we've got a couple minutes and I'm just gonna, you know, for here and we'll send a copy of this out to everybody online. I think it's also on our website. Here's some tips and tricks um, for working with your legislators. You know, it's the thing to remember about working with legislators, it's all about the relationship. Relationship building is key. Hopefully you've all had a chance to meet your legislators but with so many new ones, I know that's not entirely possible. But sort of, I would say the best time to meet your legislator is before you really need them, but sometimes you're gonna just meet them when you really need them. And, and that's what happens. Um, so, you know, if you're here today at the Capitol, you know, when you're, if you don't get the Capitol, whether it's for our event, something else, you're just coming down because you're craving that, that pizza, you know, from a, a you know, Cassettes down on Grand, whatever reason you have to be in St. Paul, try to make an appointment to see them. Um, call or email their LA or even stop by their desk to request an appointment. Now, I know you may not have been able to get one for them today. Um, it's been my experience this session. It's been exceptionally hard to get appointments because it's been so busy. But, you know, if you know you're going to be down in the future, make an appointment. It includes all of you there on the phone. Um, if you're here today and you do not have an appointment with your legislator, I still want to encourage you to swing by. Just grab the handouts, you know, grab the stuff. And um, stop by their desk. Tell, make sure you tell the LA, and LA means legislative assistant, that you are, you know, a constituent. And, um, uh, you know, if, tell them you're there. Find out if there's any way to talk with them. Sometimes they're willing, if you are from their area, to come step out of the committee and talk to you. 
Um, maybe they're not able to do that. Maybe they can talk to you when they're meeting between committees. If that can't be arranged, leave a note. Make sure your card's on there. Again, really important to emphasize you're from there and just you know, leave a note and say, hey, legislator, so-and-so, I'm sorry I missed you. Please sign on to this bill. Please support this bill. It's really important. They want to hear from the folks back home. Now, I'm going to tell you about something else that it doesn't look like you're going to be able to do today because the Senate just, I was watching on Twitter, they just adjourned their floor session. Um, but I'm going to tell you about this again if you ever come down in the future. And if you are coming down in the future and want some help with this, text me. My phone number is 651-492-3998 for those of you who don't have it. Um, if you need some assistance on that or some guidance on how to pull someone off the floor, I mean, I'm happy to give it to you. 651 <laughs> 492-3998. So if you're down here and you have questions about parks and trails related really lobbying or whatever, just give me a shout. Um, my office is literally, well, you guys can't see it, but it's like right over there. Um, but one thing you can do, especially when they start heading into lengthy floor sessions, mm -hmm. is you can go to the desk. So in the Senate, it's sort of, it's on the west corner of the building. You, you'll see the Senate chamber, the House chambers when you go up to the second floor. And in the Senate, there's a desk right next to the Senate that has a little notepad. And you just write your legislator's name on there. You, you know, in the note, you just tell them who you are and that you want them to come out and speak. Fold it in half, put the name on there and hand it to a page. Go write it in there. If, quite frankly, if you have the legislator's phone number, I will often text them as well. Um, many legislators will come out and meet you. Some won't. I'm finding that some of the freshmen are a little bit antsier about doing that, particularly right now with such close margins in the Senate. Um, so you may, if you're coming down that day, you may want to like email or call your legislator ahead of time to say, I'm going to be at the Capitol. I'm going to try to pull you off the floor. Okay. And the House also very similar process. They have an actual room where you go. They, you know, you write the name down, message, fold it up, hand it to the page, and away they go. And you kind of stand outside the things. Pretty easy, but again, if you're a first timer and you need somebody to come hold your hand on it, text me and I'll I'll help you out. Um, it's it's easier than it sounds, but um, you know, it's kind of um, you know, it's, it's like important. Waiting for a date doesn't happen. Yeah, it's waiting for a date, and I'll be honest, I have spent some time. There are some legislators, honestly, they're more likely to dodge me than they love you. They don't generally want to be dodging people who vote for them. Sometimes they may or may not want to talk to the lobbyists, especially if we're going to yell at them. I don't usually yell at them about parks and trails and others. Other matters, sometimes that happens. <laughs> um, we won't talk about that. So, um, so pulling them off the floor really easy because it's really that talking to them. When you're when you're meeting with them, again, I've got a longer list of lobbying tips. Some things to, to, to keep in mind. Um, for those of you who have met with legislators, they get distracted easily, some intentionally, some not intentionally. But if you're in a meeting with, say, Greg Davids, and he's talking about his tax for five minutes, you need to move the conversation along. Um, be sure to tell stories about how whatever you're asking for really impacts that home. So, you know, I think that being able to talk about how that park or trail really impacts them. You know, you may know what's important to your legislators. So maybe you need to talk about it from economic standpoints. You need, may need to talk about it from inclusivity standpoints, but really kind of try to go after sort of what's important to them and, and why what you need fits into that. Um, the final tip on talking to legislators, be sure you make the ask. And again, legislators can be the masters of distraction. You can be in there and you'd be like, oh, it wasn't the last one. Let's see you at the bowling alley. Oh, man, I love you. Yeah. yeah. And then you walk up and you're like, my God, best meeting ever. And then you realize you just forgot to ask them for something. Okay. So, what you need to do two things. One, make the ask. Again, today, if you're meeting with the House rep, ask them to sign on to the bill. And number two, your confidence will grow on this as you do this more. Get an answer. Because, again, legislators, just masters of distraction. And they may just be like, again, they'll just be like squirrel. They'll change the subject or something like that. They won't give you an answer. As you get more comfortable talking to legislators, try to pin them down on an answer. And some legislators, I'll be honest, they'll be like, I need to spend more time reading the bill. If you know them well enough, you can just be like, really, Steve? Come on, you know yeah. this bill. Come on, Steve. Just, just do it for me. Um, others, again, they actually may need to do it more. But, you know, promise to, if they say I need to research more, then they'll be like, great, I'm going to follow up with you and call and email you next week. Okay? But, but don't don't let them just kind of lose a lot of that. After that, you've met with them, send them a thank you note. Not enough people do that. I can tell you. 
There's been a lot of like say controversial things that have been happening in the legislature this year. They're getting a lot of angry emails regardless of which party they're in. I send them a thank you note. Say thank you for meeting with me. I really appreciate it. And you can do that, um, you know, whether it be email, handwritten, you can do it by phone call. I'll be honest, the phone, from what I've been talking to you, it may ease up. This week, last week, legislators had were coming in in the morning and had some of them had 600 or more eight voices in there. So, mm -hmm. but I would say we're, wait till it kind of eases out a little bit. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, it's all part of that building that relationship. And then, um, you know, we did a video on this um, that it's available on our website, but just a reminder, build that relationship back at home. Try to, again, when they're on break, they'll be coming home over Easter break. Um, a lot of them in greater Minnesota come home on the weekends. Maybe right now it's a little cold to take them off to a park or trail, but you know, later this spring, if you're doing, you know, it sounds like a couple of you folks are doing the, you got the chair grants, when you get those grants, bring them on out to see it there. I know that we test rode them at an event and they're, they're kind of fascinating and they can really help you understand how that can really help people access them. Invite them out for that, invite them out for a tour. Anytime you're doing a grand opening or a shoveling or whatever, you know, bring them along. And, and if they're doing good work, Praise them. Because honestly, again, they get a lot of people yelling at them. They're going to remember the people who are nice to them and thank them. So be thankful. Try to work with them. Um, and then I guess one final tip on that is be persistent. There are some legislators, I'll be honest, you just got to wear down. There's a few you'll never be able to wear down, but there's some that, like, you come back to them, you know, they can't avoid you, you know, in a polite way, and, and they're eventually going to listen. And I would also say on that, if you're having problems building a relationship in your district, these people got elected. Someone in the district likes them, okay? And so maybe figure out like what constituency base, you know, works with them and try to use that. It might be a business, it might be a club, it might be the rotary or something like that. Try to use that to build relationships. But relationships both today and long-term are the key. So next steps, um, again, for the folks who are um, online, sorry, you couldn't be with us. We will make sure that all handouts mentioned today are Included both on the website and our newsletter is going to go out later this week. For those of you who are here and going to talk, and you know, Ben is going to be running and meeting with a St. Cloud legislator, and we're going to try to catch up after that. But I want to encourage all of you to go reach out to your legislators. If nothing else, leave them a note, grab the handouts, um, you know, grab any of the other materials. Um, and if you have questions, you all have my cell phone, just text me if you're confused or find yourself somewhere on the Capitol complex and have no idea where you are. Oh yes, I tried to find an online match, or excuse me, online map to get you guys here today. We couldn't find one. You think they have maps of the building here, but we have not been able to find them. So that's a friend of mine is on the uh, Capitol area board. Uh, and she's the executive director. So she'll be getting careful from me about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, does anyone have a question before we kind of push you off to, to meet? I um, appreciate everybody who was able to make it in person. I know some folks had to switch from personal to, virt to virtual, but we got just all this new technology instrument that I am now in love with. Um, so really glad all of you could join us today. It's really cool, but it's weird how you can see it. It's similar when you can see it on the screen. Yeah. It translates better. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, like Elizabeth said, there's been a lot of information today, a lot of good information, mm -hmm. a lot of good contact, partnerships, um, mm -hmm. ideas, uh, ways to move forward. Um, if you have that chance to reach out to your legislature, uh, letters to legislator, uh, do so. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you want to get more active, uh, you can, uh, overall, the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails organization, the um, communications committee, and the membership committee um, are two ways that are extremely beneficial to our organization. And we reach out to myself or Gina, um, if you or Elizabeth, if you've got any questions or are interested. So. Yeah, we've had some, you know, folks, I, I never folks who've been on our committees have been retiring lately, great members, but we really need to replace some of our retiring folks. You know, they they, they, were, they were parks and recs directors, 
they retired from that job, spent some time with us, and now we're finally like, like really, I want to enjoy retirement. So, but some people like to do this in retirement. So if you are retired, hey, you know, just go along and be active with us to contact Gina, Ben, or myself to get on either the communications committee or the membership committee. And, and finally, the District 5, we still have a board opening on that as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have ideas, that is the southwest part of the state. So if you have ideas on um, people that might be interested, um, mm -hmm. let us know. The other okay. thing, speaking of retirements, I don't know if everyone knows this, but Audrey is retiring from DNR Grants oh. in October. <laughs> That's why she they have two positions mm -hmm. that they're hiring for. So she'll have a long runway to train someone. Mm -hmm. Now she is the fountain of knowledge. Yeah, great great. Well, yeah. Well, good info. Thanks for that. So. I thought she might mention it. And so Audrey was the one who was here, right? Yeah. Audrey and Lori. Yeah. And Lori. It was Audrey, Dan, yeah, and Sarah. Oh, uh, Sarah. Yeah, I wonder if she, when she mentioned, you know, new positions or hiring. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. We will adjourn. Thanks, to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll put together for.